Thanks to Stephen Street. And all the other people. The mod thing will never ever go away. They invented themselves in the 60s, they made a comeback in the 80s, and now in 1995, the mods are back again. Hello, welcome along. I'm Steve Lamack, and this is Secondary Modern. The phrase mod revival is enough to strike fear into many people's hearts. Ironically, the mods, once the coolest and sharpest upstarts, are often viewed with suspicion these days. Maybe because everyone's still reeling from the last mod revival, with the likes of The Chords, Secret Affair, and The Purple Hearts. But as you'll hear, many of today's new wave of Britpop bands owe a debt somewhere along the line to groups who've been brought up on a mod diet of R&B, soul, Tamla Motown, and intrinsically British pop music. Blur, for instance, aren't mod revivalists but unwittingly helped set this latest mod resurgence on its way with photo shoots posing on various scooters. And well, having Quadrophenia star Phil Daniels guest on your LP, well, that's just a present to anyone searching for their new soul rebels. Confidence is a preference for the habitual voyeur of what is known as... A morning suit can be avoided if you take a route straight through what is known as... John's got brewers through, he gets intimidated by the dirty pigeons. They love a bit of him. Who's that gut lord marching? You should cut down on your pork life, mate. Get some exercise. Except on Wednesdays when I get rudely awakened by the dustman. I put my trousers on, have a cup of tea, and I think about leaving the house. I feed the pigeons, I sometimes feed the sparrows too. It gives me a sense of enormous well-being. And then I'm happy for the rest of the day. Safe in the knowledge there will always be a bit of my heart devoted to it. Currently surfing on the wave of new British pop bands, along with the likes of Oasis, Supergrass, Menswear and the Blue Tones. And what do these bands have in common, apart from some spanking good tunes, Fred Perry t-shirts, the three-stripe Adidas trainers and short haircuts? Answer? As you probably know, they're being hailed by the music press as leaders of yet another mod revival. But before we look at what it means to be mod in 1995, let's button down our shirts and step back in time, courtesy of the old, original black and white Doctor Who TARDIS. This is where it all began. 1964, Pete Townsend. All of a sudden, kids were finding a sort of an outlet for frustration, which was positive, you know, and it was like a flag that was being waved, but in, in, funnily enough, in an incredibly British way, old man, you know, I mean, it wasn't kind of the type of outward sort of bopper rebellion that went on in James Dean Day in the States. I said, can explain? I'm feeling good now, yeah, but can explain? Ronnie Lane. We never really thought about being mods. It was just the fashions. I mean, like, the fashions used to change every week, you know? They'd always be like 
three key geezers in the dance hall that would like turn up with something new on and, and the next week like, everyone else about what they was wearing. I was never really very good mod because I, I, mean, I was paying HP for guitars and the amplifiers and things like that. And that took most of my money, so I mean, I couldn't spend all that money on clothes that some of my friends did, and scooters and things like that. I never ever started buying muddy stuff till the small faces happened and we got some bread, you know. Yes, it's all right. to work in the bank at the top of the road who had very, very short hair, always wore a nice suit, very sort of clean-cut kid. He was also an outrageous mod. He was very, very alert because he was pulled out of his head all day. Uh, his hair wasn't just short, it was also a very subtle French crew, so it was very sharp and in fashion. His suit was made out of tonic, which was very, very important. It had to be tonic. It would be in that month's colour, which would be either dark brown or dark blue. Uh, the lapels would be the exact correct width. It might be a two-button jacket or a single-button jacket. It might be a three-button jacket with the bottom and top button left undone, whatever happened to be the vogue at the time. It might have single pockets on either side that might be straight or slanted. There was a craze also for several sort of secret inside pockets. So, so, so one tended to fold one's jacket over like that and put one's hands in one's pocket, holding the jacket open so that people could see that you had the right number of inside pockets. And yet he would still get a job in a bank and he obviously had to have a job to be able to spend all this money on dope and clothes. Uh -huh. It was the man Fred. Keep on running. Keep on hiding. There was something that belonged very much to that particular generation at that particular time. But uh, it was very uh, inside and outside, you know. If you wasn't in with the lads, then you'd uh, get into a lot of bother. <laughs> <laughs> what fun do the nods get out of smashing well, things up? Well, we get a kick out of it, you know? There's nothing much else to do on a Sunday. Bank holiday money, what else can we do? So we smash it up. What do you smash up? What comes in our way, mate, you know what I mean? It, windows, if they're coming away, we smash them just anyway. 1995, and over 30 years later, Noel and Liam from Oasis prove that nothing's really changed. We just started, we had to play songs, that's all we were about, we're not about fighting, we could do the songs, do the set, get off, go home, splendid evening, had by all. You know I mean, someone gets up and thinks he's a bit hard and goes for it, he's going to get it. We've always had people at gigs who will stand there and abuse each other in the songs or throw things on stage, and we can deal with that, because, you know, uh, we can dodge bottles and we're pretty nimble guys. I can't understand the mentality of somebody who wants to go and pay money to go into a gig to go and smack one of the band. Blow. 
So apart from a handful of bands with similar attitudes and dress sense, what evidence do we have that there's really a mod revival going on? Exhibit number one. There's the success of the music itself. Blur's album Park Life has just notched up an incredible 54 weeks in the album chart, and the band have just been honoured with their own comic strip in the news of the world. Obviously, it's not the tabloids who are responsible for the mod revival, it's the mainstream music press. John Harris is a writer for the NME. I think there's a mod revival happening at the moment insofar as the way people look and the musical approach that people are adopting does owe something to the spirit that lies at the heart of some of the things that went on in the early and mid-60s. But um, I don't think there's a mod revival insofar as people in Fishtail Parkers are going to suddenly descend on Brighton and start beating up old ladies. I don't think we're going to get that, thankfully enough. You know? If that spirit, which is, you know, to do with being clipped and economical musically and sharp looking and a bit more kind of hyperactive and twitchy in your demeanour has taken hold, yeah, of course it is a reaction to people walking around with lank, greasy hair going, oh, I'm so bummed out and not, you know, doing anything more confrontational than that. I think that is the case and I think that, that youth culture does go through cyclical movements like that and I've no doubt that in two years' time you'll be sitting here asking me why everyone's looking so scruffy all of a sudden. It's a, it's, a, it's a culture of narcissism whereby what you look like is extremely important. I think, I mean, the whole way I've always thought about it is that there are two ways that you can rebel. One is to um, become a scruff and drop out and have no sense of order about your life at all as a way of protesting against the adult world. And the other is to become even more sharp and concerned about your appearance than the adult world is already, as if to say, well, you think you're together, you think you're organised, look at me. And that, to me, is what mod is about, and that's why style is central to it. Why don't you up? Fade away yeah. Yeah. Don't try to dig what we all Try to cause a big sensation Just talking about my generation Being that consumed with your appearance and the way you walk and the way you behave and the opinions of your peers is a very, very male thing. Having said that, in the 60s when the original mods were around there was a definite female aspect to it who were as consumed with the fashions and the latest dances and the groups as the men were. But I think you'll always get a split of about two-thirds a third simply because of the fact that the modern mentality lends itself to the way that men tend to think. You know, modernism, as it was called then, is just another variant of the predominant way of behaving in British youth culture, which is all based on clothes and, the, you know, the approval of the people that you knock around with and the way you walk and all that stuff. And... Yeah, it got reinvented loads of times, you know. You can see a mod element in The Clash, you can see a mod element in a lot of what even the Sex Pistols do. Certainly with people like Bowie and Boland, they both came from mod backgrounds. And then moving on later, I always thought the Stone Roses really spiritually were a mod group, insofar as they were very, very consumed with their clothes and they carried themselves with an astonishing swagger. You know, those two things together are very, very mod things to do. No, it, it's a permanent part of British youth culture and probably always will be. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a mod revival with a little bit of a new twist, I suppose. But I just dearly wish that the, some of the groups were more musically capable. Because when I watch Therm and other weekenders, I just want to run home and bury my head under my pillow and through. I mean, most of these groups, I'd say there's probably about six or seven knocking around London, are absolutely awful. I quite like men's right, so far as they're a very good caricature band who, who I think are, are a fine thing to have around as a pop group. The rest of them, I think, are either too old or too clueless or musically too useless to really do anything. So, it, I mean, that's the reason. This is, a, this is, I mean, it's saying something. This is a worse mod revival, if there is a mod revival, than the one we had at the end of the 70s. And God, that's it. When I am sad and weary When all my troubles is gone and I can't put my finger on the time things first went wrong I have a little secret I like to tell myself and until now I haven't told anybody Weary. When all my hope is gone I 
walk around my house and I think of you with nothing on. I have a list of things I go over in my mind when I could just sit right back and watch the world unwind. That's the Blue Tones, one of the bands who've been courted all over the place by major labels recently, but an indie single from them that was number 11. Now if James Brown is the godfather of soul, and John Lydon was the spiritual leader of punk, then you'd have to go back to the 70s to find the godfather of mod, or as I've recently heard him described, the mod father. Paul Weller has moved on a lot since the days of the jam, and in fact has a new LP, Stanley Road, out shortly. But where does he fit into the scheme of things now? I don't know, I don't even... I haven't got to one sit and wonder about that anyway. I don't need to, you know. I never have done, I don't think. I mean, where did the jam fit in, you know, during 77, you know? We didn't, in a way. We were kind of black sheep for a long time. But then we just got our own thing together and our own audience and, you know, and our own kind of movement, in a way. You know, we were right at that time. We were right to stick with what we were doing. It didn't matter that we wore, you know, silly black suits and white shirts, you know. But we were right in doing it, and it sort of set us apart, you know. But uh, no, I thought the jam kind of went beyond all that mod stuff, really. I mean, that was, you know, the, obviously the core of it, especially when we first started. But it was much, much wider than that after a while, you know. There was, like, student kids coming in, all sorts, even a few intellectuals, you know, who sort of liked the lyrics and got into that side of it. So I thought it was right across the board, you know, right down to, like, 10-year-old kids going out and buying Strange Town. Or, you know, I've met a lot of people in the sort of mid, late 20s recently who said the first record they bought was a jam single, you know, when they were, like, 9, 10, 11. You're still years later because of the new crop of like uh, mod fanzines and things that are around they still treat you as a kind of messiah figure do you know what i mean i know what you're saying but i don't you know i don't get i don't sit around thinking about you know am i a mod messiah or not you know it's quite funny really to think of, you know because i've got my own sort of mod messiahs you know and i feel i'm a follower i'm not i don't feel any way like i'm a leader i've always been a follower do you know what i mean mm. i don't want to feel that i have to kind of fit in all that you know, I like what Oasis is doing, you know, and occasionally I like a Blur record, or whatever it we're talking about. But are we contemporaries, you know? I don't know, you know, they're ten years younger than me, or, you know, more probably, I don't know. I'm outside of all that, I would have thought. I mean, the original things that I always liked, like the Beatles, or like Motown, Stax, Small Face, etc. I mean, I still like them, and I still listen to them, you know, all the time. But my tastes have broadened, you know, and I've dropped all my kind of prejudice towards, you know, what a band looked like, or whether they had beards or long hair, and all that nonsense, you know. So... I just listen to whatever's good now. I don't really care who it's by. I don't even want to know too much about the artists. I just want to hear the music now. I mean, for years in the Style Council, I was struggling to try and make a sound R&B. Which, looking back, I realised it's just a waste of time because real soul and real funk comes out of when you're just being yourself and it's either going to be there or it ain't going to be there, you know. Do you find it a bit um, strange, in a way, that we've now got various groups around who are referencing back to some of the things that you reference back to? We've got people like Blur looking back to yourselves and the kings right. and people like this and like you've become the inspirer 
to the next well, generation. If you live long enough, that, that's bound to happen, really. And, and you carry on, you know, making records. I think that's just age, you know. If I'd have died at 22 on a motorcycle accident or something, you know, it would have been different, wouldn't it? Yeah, I suppose it is odd, yeah. I don't know. To me, it's just because I'm 10 years old now, that's all. They started buying records, obviously, around the sort of late 70s, early 80s. And I was making records, you know, I don't know, you know. I don't feel like Ray Davis is my contemporary. I couldn't think of him like that because he's got 10, 15 years on me. And I would have thought it'd be the same for Blur as well, you know. I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's the same for all those bands. Can you lump them all in together? I don't know, you talk about Blur as a very sort of specific thing, you know, dog track bass and all that nonsense. I really like For Tomorrow, you know, talk about Blur. I really like that single. I thought it was sort of dissed a bit in the papers for being poppy, but I just thought that was a great English pop record. And I like the words. He mentions the West Way or wherever it was. Better Thought by the Charlatans was, was another good pop record. I like Oasis Full Stop, they're my favourite new band. From the past, I mean, it's just, you know, Ray Davis from like 1964 to 69. I suppose Ray Davis out of, out of everyone really, he kind of really had that capture, didn't he? And those songs still, you know, every time I walk through sunset, you know, I just think of the embankment of the Thames, you know. It's timeless for me, that. I was amazed to find that people actually related to words I was singing. Because people like, you know, Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran and all that, and Chuck Berry, I used to like the sound of what they were singing rather than what the content of the lyric. So when people came up to me and they said, I heard Wolf Blue Sunset, and I really identified with the lyric in that, I was surprised because I thought it was all mine. Dirty old river, must you keep rolling?
The White Room, hosted by Radio 1's Mark Radcliffe. Of course, with every minor music revival, you're going to hear the words bandwagon and jumping on. As you may have heard a couple of weeks ago on Radio 1's Under the Covers programme, there's already an American covers band who do nothing apart from jam cover versions. Now we find we have our own British tribute to the jam, a trio from the East End of London called English Rose. Well, I'm supposed to be Rick Butler, but my name's Lee. My name's Andy, I'll try to do the pull well a bit. And I'm Andy, I'm on bass and vocals. We are English Rose. The jam with the best band in the world, as his dad used to say, so his dad still says it and he's right. So I don't you know, sort of slag us off, he should come and see us and enjoy it and perhaps get on stage and have a laugh with us. The audience are, are blinding, you get you get youngsters there at about 16, 17 or even younger than that. And you get older people there at about 35 and even older than that. So it's, it's a good, good range of people there and they all go mad, so it's good. I was really not into this at first. I mean, he was kind of, he'd sort of wind me up with stories about how uh, we've got a nice pair of red and white spats for you to wear. But to do a tribute band, you have to. I mean, if you're going to sort of emulate what they were doing, you have to, to a degree, sort of conform dress-wise. And uh, I think we're relatively close, you know, fairly sharp suits, button-down shirts. Well, we didn't dress up as mods on, I think, but... Uh... It was that style of music, yeah, because that's what we'd all grown up listening to, so you couldn't help but play that style of music. But at that time, everyone was into indie music, which I didn't really rate at all. I thought was quite a pony, to tell the truth. And uh, we didn't go down too well at that time. Maybe now, if we went back and done our own stuff now, it's not going to last forever, of course. But while it's there, we want to do it. We like playing it, and people like coming down and listening to it and having a jump about to it and singing along to all them old songs. You name it, we do it. Some of the songs, like, because they use keyboards and we're saxophone, we do, you know, we ain't got no one. But we do, like, you know, most of the stuff from all the albums, as much as we can, you know, and perhaps do a few of their rare ones as well. This is a modern world. This is the modern world. We'll always try and start off with a bit of a bang explosion. The modern world is just a classic that seems to kind of go down particularly well. We will tend to keep the singles and the commercial ones towards the end or just slip in one or two some way through. We're into all the mod thing, but well, to me, when I was a mod, it was in 1979, and I was only nine then, but I was a proper mod when I was nine. And it was just boating blazers, bowling shoes, all the stuff that the jam wore then. It was different to, like, the 60s stuff, because they had even more stupid haircuts. And, like, the, the mod now that's come out is... I think there's a lot of rubbish involved, like... There's a lot of bands now that are saying they're, well, they're not even saying they're mod bands, but they're being hailed as mod bands, and they're not, they're not mods at all. The gear they listen to is not even mod music. Like, I often don't even like the jam. And the jam, even though themselves they said they, or well, Willis said they weren't a mod band, they was whether they liked it or not, and they was the greatest mod band ever. But mod revival now, it's, to me, it's not a revival. You don't see many mods walking down the streets. In 79 and 80, you couldn't walk down the street and not see a mod or a skinhead. But now you don't see them there, it's not really a revival, it's just a few people who've jumped on it and are blown it all out of proportion. My favourite jam song at the moment, I think, is Monday, but that will probably change. It's close between Away From The Numbers and Boy About Town. Well, when we play live, I think it's these kids, but my favourite is just Dreams Of Children Live. I got a feeling of optimism, but woke up 
Fidey Jam with their Dreams of Children. One of the current crop of bands tagged as new mod are the supremely self-confident menswear. Not since Noel and Liam Gallagher from Oasis stepped into the spotlight has there been so much hype about a band. They had a front cover on the Melody Maker before their first single was even out. They've been courted by record companies for months and recently staged a media bash to celebrate a huge publishing deal. Based in London, their ages range from 19 to 21. I recently caught up with Chris and Simon from the group in true rock and roll fashion in a hotel room post-gig having kicked off a week of live music for Bristol Sound City 95 on Radio 1. We started off, as they waited for room service, talking about what sort of fans they attract. I think they're young and they could be old. Or well, they could be, in fact, middle-aged. I think we share fans with quite a lot of the sort of bands that are coming out at the moment. A lot of, a lot of people are turning up to the gigs in Supergrass t-shirts and... And, you know, Fred Perry's and Blur t-shirts and things. And, uh, they, you know, they all tend to be into the same sort of bands. I think the bands like Supergrass and Blur and Oasis are, like, the best guitar bands that are around at the moment anyway. So I think it sort of makes sense. I mean, well, you know, everyone <coughs> talks about Wire and the Jam and the Kinks and things, and we're more interested in Adamant and Gary Newman, really, or... um around, yeah, around, yeah, or Traffic, or... Or anything else, or Crosby, Stills and Nash, and Supergrass are more interested in Gong, I think, than they are in Blur, from what I can tell, so. It was just that we wore suits, and it, it was it was just a cheap way to look cool, and um, Quentin Tarantino thing that we thought looked really, really cool. You know, the image of, of being, of, of dressing up smart, looking like a gangster or a gambler or whatever. Nick Rhodes, far cooler, I think, than Steve Marriott. Oh, I'm gonna get it for that, aren't I? But I think that's true. I've never felt like an affinity to Paul Weller or anything at all. In fact, I've always, I've never particularly liked him, really. I like the jam, but I'm not a mod. I don't think Paul Weller is a mod, I don't think he'd like to be. I think maybe if you're, if you're, if, if you're 17 in 1966, then maybe. Now, 1995. It's, um, like, means modernist, doesn't it? If, if you're a mod now, you'd be into jungle and, and trip-hop and stuff and um, wear big flappy trainers, probably. Even dance you, you would, is more modern. You'd be wearing 60 suits, so yeah. we can't be mods, can we? In, like, house, a lot of the house clubs, clothes are so much more important. And if you even look at the style, you know, recently, it's, you know, short crops and stuff, and people were wearing Kingham shirts a couple of years ago, and, you know, people were travelling around to clubs, and that was very much, you know, that was like the mod thing completely. I'd rather look like one of the Red Hand Gang, really, <laughs> or Grain Teal Circa 79 on a day off. Oh, I thought, always thought Rod Stewart was cooler than Steve Marriott, and I always liked Ron Wood, obviously, he had a great haircut as well. Yeah, <laughs> he used to, wear, he used to wear great suits, he had this suit on one photo, and he had, like, Japanese pictures all over it, of mountains and stuff, and these huge collars, and he had played it with a silvery guitar really high up, and he just looked absolutely fantastic. Because it's a real purist sort of scene, the mod thing, and we're the complete opposite that, to that, you know, we're totally open-minded, and we just didn't want to be associated with any scene that was sort of... I mean, we, we know, you know, we're not terribly forward-thinking, but... It's very yeah, cool, isn't it? Yeah. Scenes, they come and they go, and, and we don't want to go. Catch your bus by our fancy Otherwise you'll find you walking home The podcast is a race Two weeks in an awkward suit He just did the phone And turns the TV up when he gets in My favourite thing has gone away
It's the much talked about menswear and their debut single, I'll Manage Somehow. You're listening to Radio 1. I'm Steve Lamack and this is Secondary Modern. So if there is a mod revival happening and you want to be part of the gang, what do you have to do? Well, after you've written the songs, developed an attitude and notched up a few column inches, next you need the clothes. And now a recipe for essential mod wear. Take one fresh-faced pubescent young male. Add a button-down gingham shirt, preferably red and white. Mix in a well-tailored suit, but ensure the jacket only has three buttons. And leave the bottom button undone, of course. Select a very skinny tie and make a very small knot. If you're unhappy with this, find a grown-up to help you. Sprinkle with a Harrington jacket, a parka, or failing that, a triple-striped tracksuit top. Beat in with a pair of suede trainers, or at a pinch, a pair of leather loafers. Lastly, hair should be short and wispy, garnished with sideburns. Roast well at a high temperature and a smoke-filled club. Stay close to the bar, and for added effect and attention to detail, top with large dollops of cool. Serve instantly. Nothing thin A top speed No one will see it for dust That's a pint And that ain't good You need wheels If you wanna make deals You need a top If you wanna get high A man ain't a man With a ticket in his hand If you wanna get a job You need wheels Streets front and rear All the latest says it even push you a bit A payment plan that's just so unique Five hundred down and the rest that sweet You need wheels If you wanna make deals You need a top If you wanna get high A man ain't a man with a ticket in his hand If you wanna get a girl With a mouse of chrome The home plays a tune Got a wonderful tone A seven band radio stereogram Only one owner But it wants to stop me You need wheels If you wanna make deals You need a top If you wanna get high A man ain't a man With a ticket in his hand If you wanna get a job mod movement and featuring Mick Tolbert who later went on to join Paul Weller in the Style Council. That was a band called the Merton Parkers and a single called You Need Wheels which entered the top 40 at number 40 in August 1979. And talking about wheels, no aspiring young mod would be complete without transport and what better way to cruise around than your very own scooter currently enjoying a resurgence in popularity. At least according to Sticky the assistant editor of Scootering International magazine. Basically, this uh, the scooters that be acceptable to mods, uh, Vespers and Lambrettas. But there's also automatic scooters and scooters from Japan, but nobody's really interested in them. Lambrettas were made mostly in the 60s, and the company that made them in Italy went bust in the early 70s. But even though they're made other places in the world, they're still basically 60s style machines, 60s looking. Um, Vespers. They're still very much the same as they were in the 60s, but it's all been developed. Um, they use new materials like plastics, 
Oh, I've got about 15, I suppose, different ones. I use them for racing and for riding on the road, Vespers and Lambrettas, all of them. Well, you can customise them. People spend a lot of money having them um, gold-plated, chrome-plated, engraved. I chopperise them, put in extended forks in, extending the frame, adding the centre tank, like motorcycle handlebars, and tuning them up as well, making them go fast. We've got one, uh, a racing one in England that does 117 miles an hour. Second-hand scooters probably start, get a reasonable one from about 150, 200 pounds. New ones coming up towards 2,000 pounds nowadays. We're in a scooter club, yeah. Um, our club's called the Speed Demons. Uh, it's an Anglo-German club. Started in Germany in 1985. And we started an English branch in 1988. We go on rallies, we race, on and off roads. Just to have a laugh around, really, socialise. The prices are going up for vintage ones, especially. A lot of people were looking to get 60s style ones. But I don't know whether it's youngsters or people that think they've deci decided that it's a trendy way of getting about. You've now got the complete look, so where do you go? Brighton Beach is a bit chilly at this time of year, so I'm told. And besides, you don't want to end up looking like David Essex in the film That'll Be The Day, selling deck chairs to OAPs. Paul Tunkin fronts a band called The Weekenders and also DJs at a London-based club called Blow Up, where the dress code is strictly sharp but casual. Well, the club started in October 93, basically set the club up to play music that I didn't think was really being played in the clubs at the time. They were either most of London clubs seem to be pretty retro or just playing like new sort of indie sort of clubs or whatever. So it was kind of a mixture between the two, really. I wanted to sort of, sort of juxtapose sort of 90s British pop that was coming out with the 60s stuff, you know, which I think those bands were drawing from for inspiration and stuff like that, you know. A band like Blur and then obviously things like Small Faces, Kinks, just great British pop groups, really. Beatles, whatever. With a crop of bands that have come up in the last few years that obviously striving to make, you know, great records. But, you know, I think the early 90s, a lot of the bands, it was quite complacent, especially the independent scene, you know, it was like anything I'd do virtually. I, it seemed like that to me. It was really, and a very kind of unglamorous time in a way. I think the sort of baggy scene was like, had a lot of sort of, there's good bands come out of that, but none of them sort of stood the distance really at the time. That sort of went out and this was the American grunge scene come in, which was, for the most part, I thought quite depressing. So. Essentially for me with the club, it was like setting something up that would play stuff that I wanted to hear initially. The band got together about 93, I was just writing songs. I was just um, rehearsing in the basement of the shop in Camden and just working with Chris, who plays bass, and it just took us ages to find a drummer, really, and just had an ad in the shop and met Steve, and I think we met a guitarist, James, for either in loot or something like that. <laughs> Essentially, I'm really into writing songs, really, and it was just really just doing a band that I could just draw on all the different stuff we've been into, really, and I think, I suppose, you know, all the songs had to fit a certain criteria, you know, that being hopefully, like, pretty high energy delivery you know it was like you know i suppose it's kind of a punk thing as well a lot of us are into that kind of stuff just energetic sort of short sharp pop songs really because most of our songs aren't don't uh, go over three minutes anyway put a stopwatch on them it just seems to be like the right climate really for making a lot of good records i think you know there's a lot of good bands and they're all in competition with one another so i suppose it's classic ingredients really people strive harder don't they
can, you know, apart from the obvious sort of amphetamine speedy thing, but even aside from it, it's just very clean cut, clean, you know, separate words, clean, and very cut, very sharp and motivated. The whole mod thing I still take seriously, and in pop culture I still do it. It's very best, you know. But I still believe in all those things. I still think they're art forms, and I still think they're, you know, they ain't got to be intellectualised for me. They just, but they're to be taken seriously. You know, we've had, you know, we just with pop music, we've had you know over 30 years now of it, and it's still no one takes it that seriously still. You know, apart from like the people who are involved in it, or you know, which is a small number of people when you think about it. You know, the actual people who turn out for Glastonbury or it's tiny compared to the population. You know. People still see it as being quite throwaway, you know. I suppose a lot of aspects of it are, but they're still, you know, clothes are still important to me. I still take them really seriously, but in a different way from someone who goes to a designer shop, you know. It's a different thing. And music and buying records still is still really it's vital to me, you know. It's still really important. And I don't feel silly still feeling like that, you know. And I guess that's my motivation. I still believe in it all. But every now and again, you're reminded of something. You see a good record and see, that's, that's why, you know. That's why I still like it. Or you get to talk to a bunch of friends and you start talking about music or records or whatever it is, and whatever you got into it in the first place. Or talking about Lennon or, you know, whatever it is. But as long as you get those moments every now and again, that reminds you. Of me. certain classic thing we were talking about, clothes or records that came from the mod, the whole mod movement of the 60s, or late 50s really, I don't mean to put it correctly, but they will never go away, they're, they're classic things, you know, they're things that you know will always work and look good or sound good, I know it's all down to personal taste, but there is that certain area where it's, things will always sound good or look good, and the mods have good taste, you know, you can't deny it, you know, I don't know about the 1979 revival, but you know, it's sort of the real thing, you know. But acid jazz, I mean, that whole movement was born out of, you know, all old mods. And the clothes might have changed, but the actions were kind of still very similar, you know, quite forward-looking and trying to get with what black music was doing at that time, you know, contemporary black music. And I think it's a good influence, you know. 
good haircuts anyway. I think he's one of the few people who could sit down and say, I am a mod, I'm not looking any way ludicrous or cheap for doing it. He's, he's one of the few figures we've had over the last sort of 15 or 20 years who to me does understand the mindset of the original mods and, and took it a stage further and has had that all the way through his career. Yeah, and I think his, his influence on bands recurrently, every year you can, you can see people who have taken his example, so he is very, very, very important. Maybe things have come round a little bit so that people are more attuned to the kind of music that he's making, which maybe wasn't the case four or five years ago. It's also down to the fact that I think he's rediscovered what he's really, really good at, which is orthodox rock music and crashing his hand down a guitar and not making digitised, synthesised dance influence music. So, I mean, you know, those two things together mean a career in Aesons, and it's justified because his new album's absolutely brilliant. And if you took a jam fan in a time machine from 1979, took him to a Weller gig now, he'd recognise the basics of what he was seeing, which isn't, wasn't the case with the Style Council. Do you think it's all a bit dangerously nostalgic, or is looking backwards? It needn't be nostalgic if, as I say, you take the basic spirit and you seek to do something different with it. That's fine. I, it, you know, the, 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 the mod spirit is something to be fiercely proud of and is one of the great things about British youth culture, as opposed to American youth culture, say. As long as people don't get bogged down in wanting to live in 1965 and do windmills and have arrows all over their shirts and all that nonsense, then we'll be OK. Some people are but I know they must be crazy. Can't see their misfortune. walking down Carnaby Street in about 1982 with my younger brother in a load of clothes that I'd just bought, convinced that I'd crash-landed in the photo shoot for a jam single called News of the World. We actually replicated it while my mum followed us down the street taking photographs. <laughs> if you take it as a basic way of operating and then bring in your own original thinking, as is the case with all youth movements, then you're off and then we will get valuable, decent things out of it. John Harris from The Enemy with his very own mod moment. We've all had them. Mine was in a tailor's in Tooting in South London, but that's another story. And no, before you ask, this mod revival probably won't last long, but while it does, here's to Britpop 95. Okay. And the winner is... Blur! Hotline! Mod, with its musical influences and style-conscious thinking, will always be around. Everywhere you look, you can see bands who have some mod streak in them. Whether it's the Inspiral Carpets, or the Hammond organ sound of the Charlatans, Weller himself, or Oasis, even the Stone Roses. Mod, with its ongoing influence on British pop music, still plays a part. And of course, they're still Blur. What, what, what do you say? We've, we've run out. There's a lot of people here um, who have influenced us. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> Thanks to Stephen Street. Stephen Street cheers. Our mums and um, all the other people. 
Blur at the Brit. It's a mod world, remember? And tomorrow is always a bank holiday. Grandma needs a dentist. Take a nap by her daughter. Because she puts her on top. Kids are eating Snickers. Because they're so delicious. And they're sticking fingers. But mama loses her face. Back all night, come six times a year. Back on the corner to each and we want to change. Back on the day, come six. Pack a beer, then it's back to work. Modern was presented by Steve Lamack and produced by Claire Pattenden.